Chapter 14 is a rather big one because it combines the muscles and the skeletal system in one. Most of the medical terms in this chapter are going to be uh, associated with bones, but a significant number of muscles are going to be in here too. If you've had anatomy and physiology before and had to learn the different bones with their name and location, you're going to be at a great advantage for this particular chapter. If not, don't worry, it's just going to be a little bit more effort on your part in terms of the anatomy. The first thing that we're going to do here is do a refresher on what are the key organs and the key structures involved in this muscular skeletal system. Once you have that kind of basic understanding, then we can begin to assign medical terms to those things. So in terms of the components of the muscular skeletal system, you have your muscles, obviously, and your bones. But it also includes bone marrow, joints, cartilage, tendons, ligaments, and bursa. So pretty much everything that combines bones and muscles together and allows you to, you know, move. An adult has 206 bones and over 600 muscles. You're clearly not going to be asked to know what all of those are, but we are going to have terms that are going along with a lot of them. And if you didn't already know, a joint is anywhere two bones meet, and between those two bones you have a level of cartilage and bursa. So for example, your knee joint, or your shoulder joint, your elbow joint, and so on. The function of the muscular skeletal system is pretty straightforward. It helps you move, um, it helps protect your soft organs, for example, your rib cage is protecting your lungs and your heart, your skull protects your brain. Uh, other things you might not necessarily know or think about is producing heat. Your muscles produce a lot of heat for you to stay warm, as well as your bones store calcium and produce the blood cells. So those are the overall major job of the muscular skeletal system. And it's not really important for the medical terms you're going to learn, it's just a good idea to know what that function is. On page 580 in your textbook, you're introduced to the bone structure. So you're given a picture of a long bone cross section. And the reason they're doing this is there are a few medical terms that go along with a few of these different parts. So the periosteum is that outermost layer on the bone. It's kind of the, the fibrous coating that surrounds the bone. Inside that you have compact bone. That's the dense, hard, you know, outside that you would typically associate with a bone. We also have calcaneus bone, which is the spongy bone. And that's where there's small little, it's called spongy because there's little sponge spaces in between and it is encased in the compact bone. So usually you see that it towards the ends of the bone. You also have an endosteum. An endo, you know, means inner, so that's why it's the inner lining of a hollow cavity of a bone. In terms of location within the bone, you have uh, diaphysis and epiphysis. So the diaphysis is the long shaft or the central part of the bone, whereas epi, um, you know, means upper or outer, are the ends of the long bone. Inside the hollow cavity of the bone, you have bone marrow, and that sits itself in the cavities of the bones themselves. You actually have two different kinds of marrow. You have red bone marrow, that that is kind of in the ends of long bones, and that's where red blood cells are formed. You also have yellow marrow, and that's kind of a fatty material in the center portion of your long bones. This and the next several slides are just going to run through the basic skeletal bones that you're going to be associating with medical terms. The first of which 
has to do with the jawbone. So you have an upper jawbone where you know your top teeth are attached and you have your lower jawbone and you can see it in the picture here. Your lower jawbone kind of makes an L shape that's where your bottom teeth and chin are attached. The upper jaw is called maxilla and lower jaw is called mandible. Another part of the skeletal system that's going to be important for you to know is the vertebral column. So each individual part of the vertebral column is called a vertebrae, or plural would be vertebra, excuse me, vertebrae is plural, vertebra is singular. And the, there is a hole in the center of each vertebra, and that is where the spinal cord runs through. So the job of your vertebrae is to protect that spinal cord, as well as support your head and act as a point of attachment for things. And the vertebral column is broken down into a few different sections. So the top, towards your head and neck area, are the cervical vertebrae. There are seven um, discs there, and those are called C1 through C7. And that little curve, as seen in the picture, forms the neck. Underneath that, you have the thoracic vertebrae, and there are 12 of them. So they are called T1 through T12. And this is where the ribs attach to the vertebral column. So it's up in the thoracic cavity, which is why they are called the thoracic vertebrae. When you continue down the vertebral column, underneath the thoracic vertebrae, you have lumbar vertebrae. And this is where you get that inward curve for your lower back. Also, this is where the source of most people's back problems are. And there's only five of them. They're rather large. They are called L1 through L5. Underneath that, you have a sacrum. So these are fused vertebrae and begin to form um, kind of in your butt region, I would say. There's a series of five vertebrae. And then the last final portion is called the coccyx. It's four tiny little vertebrae that are fused together, and that's what we consider our tailbone. So all four or five sections together act as the vertebral column. Other important bones to know, uh, here we're just giving you the medical term and then what that means in you know, layman's everyday terms. Your clavicle, you have two of them, those are your collarbone, uh, so you should be able to feel them on the front right underneath your neck. They stretch horizontally across. Uh, your shoulder blades are called your scapulas, you have two of them, one on each side. Um, your breastbone that runs down um, the front of your chest is called your sternum. And then in your upper extremities, uh, your arms and hands, you have two humeruses or humeri. Those are the upper arm bones. Your lower arm bones, you have a radius and an ulna, one on each side. Um, the way that I kind of keep it straight is one of them connects to the elbow, and that's the ulna. You also have um, wrist bones and hand bones. So the wrist bones are the carpals, the hand bones are the metacarpals, and your fingers are your phalanges. So you know you only have 10 fingers. However, within each one of those fingers, there are several tiny bones linked together by joints. So that's why you have a total of 28 of them 14 in each hand. Pelvic bones, you have three of them. Um, it's technically three pairs that are fused together. So you have an ilium on each side, and that's kind of what you would think of as your top part of your hips. So if you were to put your hands on your hips, you're situating your hands right on top of that ilium bone. Uh, Underneath that, you have what's called an ischium, and that makes the kind of bottom 
U-shape of the pelvis. Finally, you have a pubis, which comes together in the front and fuses together. And then within that area of the ilium, ischium, and pubis, that's the, the, the hole in the center, um, creates the pelvis. Your lower extremities, um, you have a femur, which is the upper leg bone. In your lower leg, you have a tibia, which is the front bone, that's your shin. In the fibula, which is a skinnier uh, bone in the back, behind the tibia. Your knees are called your patellas. And then your ankles, feet, and toes kind of go similarly as your hands did. Instead of carpals, here we have tarsals. And your uh, foot bones are your metatarsals. And then your toes, even though they're smaller, you still have 28 of them, are also called phalanges. All of your fingers and toes go under the same name, phalanges. Now notice in these breakdowns of, you know, skeletal parts, we didn't name each and every part, each and every bone. We just kind of hit the highlights that are going to have medical terms with them later on. I encourage you to spend some time with a you know, skeleton diagram, just practicing the location and names of what the different bones are, as well as taking the skeleton, naming the bones, and then in a little bit when we learn the word roots for each one of these bones, to be able to write them next to the word. That's going to be a helpful study tool for you. These next two slides are going to be giving you a background on joints. We're going to have medical terms associated with these as well. Um, so a joint is anything that holds bones together and helps you make movement. And there are a few different types of joints. Here we have articular cartilage, which is a smooth layer that covers the surface of the joint. Um, you can see it in the bottom right picture here. It kind of just covers the ends of the long bones. We also have something called a meniscus, which is found specifically in the knee. Within each one of your vertebrae, you have what are called intervertebral discs. And then we also have joint cartilage in the pubis as well, called the pubic symphysis. And that is where the two pubic bones come together. Other things you're going to find in the joint, synovia, also known as synovial fluid. And this is a type of fluid that's secreted by a special membrane that sits in between the joints in the joint cavity. And this fluid just helps to act as an extra buffer of padding and lubrication to help the bones uh, or keep them from rubbing against each other. We also have bursa. Uh, which is a fluid-filled sac. It's kind of like a little water balloon, if you will, that again allows for easy movement of one joint over the other. We're going to find there's diseases or disorders where um, that sac wears away or is degraded. You can also have injuries where you pop it. It is like a water balloon. So if for some reason you have some kind of sports injury, for example, you can pop that bursa. And once it's popped, then that's kind of it. We also have ligaments and tendons. Um, they are different. Ligaments connect bone to bone. So it's a, a band of really tough connective tissue um, that connects one bone to another. And we're going to see what that looks like a little bit later on. But uh, one example here is in that top picture, the knee you have uh, a piece of fibrous tissue connecting the patella, which is your kneecap, to the um, tibia, which is that lower leg bone. Um, a tendon is similar, but connects a muscle to bone. Finally, an aponeurosis. It's introduced here, and we're only really going to have one medical term that goes along with it. Um, and that acts as a tendon 
to attach muscle to bone. So it's a, a, just a different type of tissue. It's a specific type of tissue connecting a tendon to a bone. This picture is on 586 of your textbook. Uh, I'd again just get familiar with where the different locations are so that way you have a better understanding of the medical terms when we get to them. We haven't really talked about muscle up until this point, but it is uh, a key component of this chapter. So there is a background in your book that discusses the different types of muscle, one of which is skeletal muscle, and that's shown here. Uh, it's the striated or kind of striped muscle, and its job is to help make movement possible. Because it's skeletal, it connects your bones um, by tendons to the muscles. And this is how we get uh, muscles working in opposition to help move your body, like your bicep and your tricep, for example. And these are voluntary because we do control our own body movements. The second type of muscle tissue is the smooth muscle, and it's called smooth because it doesn't have those striations or stripes. And this particular type of muscle is in the internal organs. So it kind of acts as the lining throughout your blood vessels and your digestive tract. Um, and these are involuntary because you really have no conscious control over them. The last muscle category is cardiac muscle. And it's called that because it forms most of the walls of your heart. And again, this one is also involuntary because you don't really control the contractions of your heartbeat. The last thing we need to review before we actually get to the medical terms is body movement. So here you can see how bones and muscles work together to produce various movements. And you will be responsible for knowing what these different movements are. Um, so the first of which in this picture is flexion and extension. So these are opposites. Um, flexion is whenever you bend a limb or decrease the angle between a bone and a joint. So for example, bending your leg or bending at the knee decreases that angle. The opposite is extension. And that's where you straighten the position or increase the angle. The next pair is pronation and supination. Supination is where the palm is up, for example, in that anatomical position we've learned about. If the palm is down, that is pronation. On the right, we have abduction and adduction. Abduction is away from the body or away from the midline of the body. And adduction is toward the midline of the body. So I always think, you know, adduction, you're adding it back to your body. On the bottom, we have eversion and inversion. And this has to do with um, how you bend, for example, your ankle or your foot. So inversion means you're turning it inward. Eversion means you're turning it outward. And the last is just rotation. So for example, if you move your head from one side to the other, that would be rotation. So now we've finally, after an extensive review, are ready to look at the combining forms of the muscular skeletal system and joints. You'll notice there are a ton of terms on this slide. However, if you know the anatomy already, you know what the bones are and what they correspond to, you're in a great advantage here. Most of them follow with what the bone is named. Um, so for example, carpo is for your carpals. Clavico is for your clavicle, uh, and so on for most of these. Uh, one you might not be familiar with, costo. Costo is your ribs. So if you're talking about a rib um, issue, uh, note that femoral 
or femoro, depending on how you pronounce it, has an O. Normally, femur is spelled F-E-M-U-R, but when we put it in a combining form, you use O. Um, other ones that are a little tricky, lumbo means the lumbar region of your spine. So it's not a particular vertebrae, it's pinpointing that section. Uh, your pelvis can be either pelvi with an I or pelvo with an O. Again, you can use them interchangeably. Notice how uh, your vertebrae or your spine vertebral column, there are three choices here, rachio, spondylo, and it should be vertebro. There's a typo there. Um, vertebro would be the easiest one for you to memorize. However, spondylo is used quite often in medical practice. Not to be confused with radio that goes with your radius. Otherwise, all of the other ones that I didn't mention are fairly straightforward with the bone that they correspond to. The exercise that I'm recommending here is going to be really good review. Um, and what I would recommend is, you know, keeping these two figures flagged for, as a good review for test time. In addition to the combining forms for the skeletal system, we do have some for joints as well. For example, aponeuro goes for aponeurosis. Um, arthro, arthro is the generic word for joint. Uh, so if you're not localized to one particular joint, then you're going to use arthro. Uh, chondro means cartilage. So if you're talking about the cartilage in those joint areas. Disco. Disco relates to specifically an intervertebral disc. Uh, let's see. And then the last one, teno, tendo, tendino. All three of those relate to tendon. Again, you can use them interchangeably, but we're going to find that some of them are more used in certain circumstances than others. This is another diagram that I would keep handy when you are reviewing for the test on this particular section. The last set of combining forms is associated with the muscles. Um, and other parts of the body. So the first one, ankylo, you'd think would go to your ankle. However, it means stiff or bent. So if you think about your jo joints stiffening over time. Kinesio is movement or motion. For example, kinesiology is the study of movement. Kypho is a hump. So, for example, there's the condition of, you know, being a hunchback, we're going to use kypho. Lamino has to do with your lamina, which is a thin, flat layer. Lordo means bent forward. In this case, um, kind of goes along with kypho. Uh, it's kind of a lesser degree or lesser uh, extreme version of kypho. Myo is muscle. We learned that one before. We also have myoso meaning muscle as well. Milo with an E in there means bone marrow. So when we're talking about that inner bone marrow of the bone, we use myelo. Osteo is the generic version of bone. And petro Petro means stone, so we're going to have a few instances where bone begins to turn to stone. And then scolio. Scolio means curved or crooked. For example, scoliosis. Now, here I want you to note that scoliosis or scolio has to do with the spine curving, you know, right or left, if you're looking straight at someone's back. Whereas Lordo and Kypho have to do with um, the concavity of the spine, not necessarily its curving outward to the side. There are a few prefixes and suffixes in this chapter. 
Um, inter means between. So we've seen intra before, meaning within. Here we have inter, meaning between. Supra, as you can imagine, like super or superior, means above. Sim and sin means together or joined. In terms of the suffixes, we have asthenia is the first one, and that means weakness. So, for example, a certain type of muscle weakness would have asthenia as a suffix. Break has three suffixes you can use. Clasia, clasis, or clast. All of them mean break, and usually this is going to be associated with bones. Desis means a surgical fixation or fusion. Uh, for example, many people with back problems might need to have two vertebrae fused together. That's when you would use desis as a suffix. Physis means growth. Um, your bones grow from the ends, so we call that epiphysis. We'll see it also in a few other terms. And the last one, schisis, means split or fissure. So if something splits open, for example, we're going to see that one. I know we've had a lot of terms. Uh, and this is a doozy of a chapter. It's one of the biggest in the book. But once you begin to put them together, we're going to be able to make a lot of the words in the rest of this chapter so it won't seem so difficult. So we finally arrived at the diseases and disorders. So first we're going to put together all of the word roots, prefixes, and suffixes that were introduced into this chapter. And then we'll eventually move on to all the diseases and disorders that are not built from word parts. Here is the first part of the list. Notice how a lot of the suffixes are ones that have been introduced in previous chapters. For Example, osis is abnormal condition, and itis, if you remember, is inflammation. Malacia is a softening of, let's see, um, one that is in this chapter that hasn't been mentioned before, and you might want to make a special note of it, is in algia. A-L-G-I-A in the word fibromyalgia. Um, algia means pain. So in this case, it's been introduced in another chapter. So fibromyalgia would be pain of the fiber muscles. Uh, let's see. All the other ones we've seen before are in this chapter. So when you put it together with the word roots that we've learned, you should be able to form what the word means. One example is craniosciasis. So schisis, if you remember, means fissure. And then cranio means cranium. So it literally means fissure of the cranium. And... Mm, Myasthenia, if you remember, asthenia means weakness. So when you put it together with myo, it means muscle weakness. But notice how the o in myo is taken out because the suffix starts with a vowel. Uh, kyphosis, as I mentioned before, kypho is where you have that hunchback. So kyphosis literally translates to an abnormal condition of a hump, which is why we just call it a hunchback. Osteoarthritis is the last word on this list. It's abbreviated O-A. And when you put those two word roots together, it means inflammation of both areas, both the bone and the joint. Here's a picture example of a few different knee joint conditions. These are on your, your book, page 602. 
The top left is a normal, happy, healthy joint. If you look at B, B is an example of osteoarthritis. So there is inflammation in both the bone and the joint. And you can see how there is some cysts occurring. So you're getting some fluid-filled sacs. Um, the space between the bones is diminished, and that's when you're going to start to get bone grinding on bone. The last picture in C is rheumatoid arthritis, um, so inflammation of the joints. And you can see the inflamed tissue surrounding the joint area and how it's created uh, certain bone wasting away. There's an open space. It shouldn't be as open, and you'll still have that bone grinding on bone. This is the second half of the list for words built from word parts. Looking at this list, one suffix that we have uh, not seen before that is introduced in this list is penia, P-E-N-I-A, in the word osteopenia. And penia means a reduction in number. So osteopenia would be the reduction in number of, or I guess reduction in the amount of bone mass. And you'll see it again later in sarcopenia, which is reduction in the amount of connective tissue. Another suffix you might not have seen before, or actually you've seen all of these. Uh, putting it together with multiple root roots, we have a few of them. Uh, for example, polymyositis would be inflammation of many bones. Rhabdomyolysis. Lysis is one you have not seen before. Um, lysis means a dissolution or a breaking apart of. That's another one you're going to want to make a special note of. Because we're not going in the order of the textbook, there's a few that you need to be taught along the way. Um, otherwise, you should uh, know what all of these parts mean and should be able to now put them together in exercise 20 to create the words that mean the given definition. We're now going to move on to the diseases and disorders that are not built from word parts. The first one is ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, so this is partially built from word parts. Looking at spondylitis, it is um, you know, inflammation of the spine. And this is a form of arthritis that first you know, affects the spine and gives you that forward bend. So it gives you a little bit of a hunch. Um, there's a few different names that it goes by. For example, rheumatoid spondylitis is another name. The second term, bunion, is pictured there at the right. And it's a joint, usually um, associated with the big toe. And it protrudes out. It's an abnormal protrusion of that area. It's a common problem, sometimes hereditary or from wearing um, you know, poorly fitting shoes. That's why it's a common woman issue from wearing heels. But the... Uh, you know, the abnormal shoe forces that joint to be pushed out and eventually it protrudes out farther and farther and that's what creates the bunion. The next is carpal tunnel syndrome or CTS as it's abbreviated. And what happens here is it's a common nerve issue. So the bones in the wrist compress on the nerve running through the wrist and therefore it causes a great amount of pain and it can sometimes lead to uh, a numbing sensation in your hands and your fingers 
There's a picture in your book on page 608 that shows you carpal tunnel. And I'll show you what it looks like on the next slide as well. The next one is the Collie's fracture, and that's pictured at the rightmost on this slide. It's basically a specific type of wrist fracture that happens at the very end of your radius, um, where the uh, radius bone connects to the wrist bones. And usually this is associated with a fall of some kind and you try to catch yourself from falling. Uh, you can imagine how snowboarders and skaters, this is a common issue. Uh, when they fall off, then they try to catch themselves um, with their hands and do a poor job giving themselves the collis fracture. The next one is exostosis. Exostosis is the medical term for a bone spur. And it's just a growth on the surface of a bone. So it's not cancerous, it's just an extra growth on a bone. So oftentimes it's a heel spur um, when it happens on the bottom of your foot. And you can imagine how this extra mass can lead to great pain depending on where it is. The medical treatment for this would be to go in and kind of just file it away, uh, leaving a smooth surface with less pain. The next is fracture. Your book goes through a few different types of fractures. You won't be expected to know what the different ones are, but you should know that the medical abbreviation for a fracture is FX. Gout. Gout is a disease where you have a buildup of uric acid in the blood, and that buildup causes crystals to form, and those crystals deposit themselves specifically in the joints and those deposits don't allow the joints to function properly so you can get arthritis um, and this is kind of a chronic condition that comes and goes usually can be controlled with diet so you're not ingesting too much uric acid. The last one on this list is a herniated disc. This is also called a slipped disc or a ruptured disc um, a few other names as well, but basically what it means is those cartilage discs in between your vertebrae, one gets pushed out of its normal location. So it's going to protrude out, and when it does this, it puts extra pressure on the spinal cord, and that's what causes the nerve pain associated with a herniated disc. Here's an example of what carpal tunnel looks like. So you have a median nerve that runs down um, vertically into the hand and then branches off into your fingers. And that nerve is topped off with specific tendon tissue um, or flexors. And when you get carpal tunnel, those flexors get tighter and tighter and tighter and they put pressure on the median nerve. And that's why we get the, the hand pain. Uh, so surgically, they have to kind of go in and open that up to relieve the pressure. Continuing on with the terms that are not built from word parts, we have Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection that's usually carried by deer ticks. Um, it's a common issue here in the Midwest. And it causes your body's immune system to react. Uh, you might get a rash, a fever, joint pain. Uh, the joint pain associated with it is kind of why it's lumped into this chapter. Many of the symptoms of this disease resemble muscular skeletal diseases. Muscular dystrophy, abbreviated MD, is a hereditary condition uh, where the muscles begin to degenerate. Um, so they begin to break down and they begin to weaken. So once they weaken to a point, you're kind of unable to move that limb or that arm, leg, and confined to a wheelchair. The next is myasthenia gravis. And this is also muscle weakness, but it's a different reason. Here you have defective transmission of impulses from the nerve to the muscle. So it's not that the muscles are breaking down, 
It's the communication system between your nervous system and the muscles. So your, your nervous system can't tell the muscles what to do. So therefore, you get muscle weakness. The symptoms are similar to muscular dystrophy. It's just a different cause. Next, we have osteoporosis. Um, and this is a loss of bone density. So uh, you kind of begin to get small holes in your bones. And this can lead to increases in things like fractures because you don't have that density. They're not as strong as they once were. This is a common issue um, for older individuals, especially older women. Plantar fasciitis is the next term, and this is inflammation um, in the connective tissue on the sole of your foot. And this is um, due to a repetitive in injury, so a lot of sports people uh, who, you know, bend their foot in a particular way repetitively can get plantar fasciitis. We have rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid is a chronic issue, um, again autoimmune in this case, and the autoimmune inflammation results in that arthritis symptom, that inflammation of the, of the joints. The next two terms kind of go together, spinal stenosis and spondylithiasis. Spondyl stenosis, the word stenosis means narrowing. So in this case, you have a narrowing of the spinal canal. And I'll show you a picture momentarily. But the spinal cord has a certain you know, hole to run through in the spinal cord. And in spinal stenosis, that hole narrows. So you can pinch on the spinal cord. Spinal lithiasis is where one of the vertebrae moves and slips over the other. And again, that movement can put extra pressure on the spinal cord. So here's an example of those last two conditions. They're in your book on page 611. The left one is spondylithiasis. You can see here how um, the one disc has kind of slipped over the other, and you're putting that extra pressure on the spinal cord. And on the right, that hole in the center uh, where the spinal cord would normally run through, you can see has been narrowed in that medical condition. This is just a, a reference table for you to tie the medical term that we've learned in this chapter with the common everyday word that we talk about. So for example, kyphosis we know is a hunchback or a humpback. Um, an exostosis is known as a spur, and a herniated disc is known as all of those different things. We're now going to move to the surgical terms in this chapter. This is good because there are only terms that are built from word parts and none relating to surgical terms that are not built from word parts. So on this list, I want to draw your attention to a number of suffixes that haven't been specifically taught to you yet because we're jumping around the chapter in the textbook. So please make a special note. Here we have RAPHY, R-R-H-A-P-H-Y, as seen in the first word. RAPHY as a suffix means suturing. So you are um, suturing something up, and depending on what you put it with, that tells you what you are suturing. The next is centesis, C-E-N-T-E-S-I-S, -E -E as in arthrocentesis. That suffix means surgical puncture to aspirate fluid. What this means is you basically surgically make a hole to suck out whatever fluid is building up and causing pressure. Um, we've seen clasia, or we've seen clasis and clasp. Clasia is the surgical breaking. And you ask yourself, why would you possibly want to surgically break something? But there are instances where a joint has become so stiff that it can't move, so you surgically break um, a stiff joint, and that would be what 
our thoroughclasia is. Desis, we know, is surgical fixation or a fusion, for example. Um, so if you need to fuse a joint together, maybe it's the shoulder, maybe it's the elbow, desis is the surgical fusion. Plasty is the generic term for surgical repair. So if you need to do some kind of repair on a joint, you'd see arthroplasty. We've seen ectomy before, that's surgical removal. So a burstectomy would be removing of the bursa. On the right side, you'll notice in uh, bold is tomi, or tami, depending on how you pronounce it. And that is a surgical incision. It goes along with ectomy. Ectomy is surgical removal. If you get rid of the EC and just have Tommy, then it is surgical incision. In this case, a craniotomy would be an incision into the cranium. Now that you know all of those suffixes, you just put them together with the word roots that we've learned and you can mix and match and make all of the different surgical procedures. Here's the second half of the list of surgical terms. And these lists are rather long, but I want to encourage you to not spend too much time learning each and every individual term that's built from word parts. I would suggest spend most of your time learning what the different word parts are. And once you know them, you can quickly combine them in any way that you need or break down these words into their definition. You won't be able to do that unless you know what each part means. And many of these are going to be used over and over and over again in combination to make many different words. So it's easier on yourself to devote your time to studying those word parts, not memorizing each one of these diseases or surgical terms by sight. Many chapters are going to include diagnostic terms as well. In this case, there's only a few of them. And diagnostic terms have to do usually with imaging, diagnosing the problem at hand, figuring out what it has to, what the issue is. It also includes, you know, endoscopic procedures, all types of uh, viewing, imaging, lab tests, that kind of thing. So here you have orthography, which is a diagnostic imaging procedure. Um, graphy means image. Uh, and in this case, we now use an MRI machine. Um, we also have endoscopy, which is orthoscopy, visual visualization or viewing of the joint. Uh, if they don't necessarily know what's wrong and want to look at the joint itself, you would kind of put an endoscope in and look around to get an idea. That's arthroscopy. The last one, electromyogram and EMG is just kind of how it sounds. Gram as a suffix means record. So this would be a record of the electro electrical activity of your muscle is an electromyogram. And it's kind of giving an idea of the muscle's ability so you can measure strength and weakness.
We are now moving on to complementary terms. Um, we're first going to look at ones built from word parts, and there are going to be several that are not built from word parts. There are a ton of complementary terms in this chapter, uh, mostly in reference to pertaining to different bones. And so the first part is to remember what all the different suffixes are for pertaining to. Um, we have al, ar, um, other ic. Those three are all used on this page, and they all mean pertaining to, and then whatever bone they happen to be talking about. They could use multiple word roots and talk about more than one area. So, for example, if I say iliofemoral, that would mean pertaining to the ilium and the femur. Uh, if we remember the suffix for the first word here, an arthralgia, algia means pain. So, arthralgia would be pain in the joint. Um, trophy, uh, I don't remember if we've seen that one before or not. Trophy is development, and the prefix A means without, so atrophy would be without development. And really what that means is if you have muscle atrophy, then it's not developing, it's wasting away. Uh, bradykinesia, brady as a prefix means slow. Make a special note of that one because it's specifically talked about in a chapter we haven't covered yet. So slow movement. Uh, let's see, what other ones might you have trouble with? So if bradykinesia means slow movement, dyskinesia means abnormal or painful movement. Um, atrophy would be without development. Dystrophy is abnormal or painful development. So think of muscular dystrophy. Um, another suffix in here that you've not seen before is in the word osteoblast. Blast as a suffix means developing cell. So an osteoblast would be a developing bone cell whereas an osteocyte is a mature bone cell. Here's the remainder of the list from word parts. There is nothing on this list that hasn't been introduced to you already. It's just putting them together in new ways. Uh, remember, again, all of the suffixes meaning pertaining to. You have AL, IC, AR, and more. Now, there's a commonly used medical one, as you're seeing on these slides. But when you have to build these words, if you use one instead of the other, that means pertaining to that's okay. It would be considered equally correct. So if you said pubol or puber instead of pubic, that would still be technically correct. We're moving on to the complementary terms that are not built from word parts, and most of them are pretty easy to get um, and go hand in hand. Uh, Turopodist or what more commonly is a podiatrist, is a specialist treating and diagnosing disorders of the foot. So a podiatrist is the foot doctor, and um, they do medical and surgical consults for feet, which is part of the skeletal system. Um, chiropractic has to do with the specialty of the vertebral column. So the chiropractor is a specialist of chiropractic. They specialize in the vertebral column. Uh, a weird word is crepitus, and this is the crackling sound you hear when two bones 
rub against each other. So if you've ever, you know, sat down and stood up and you hear the cracking in your knee joint, that would be crepitus. Or, um, you know, you move your hand or wrist and your bones pop. Orthopedics, or ortho as it is abbreviated, is the field of medicine dealing with mus the muscular skeletal system. So if you have something wrong with your muscles or your bones, you would go to the orthopedist, which is the physician who specializes in the muscular skeletal system. Orthotics. Orthotics are the making and fitting of orthopedic things, like supports or alignments, things like that. Oftentimes it could be foot insoles to um, help correct foot issues, maybe a collapsed arch, but it really could be anywhere in the body for an orthotic. It's some kind of support. Orthotist is the person who does orthotics. Osteoclast, um, we saw previously we have osteoblast an osteocyte, but an osteoclast is a specific bone cell that absorbs and removes minerals, helping to keep your bones healthy. Um, next we have osteopath, which is abbreviated DO. Uh, osteopath is the person who studies osteopathy, which is the branch of medicine for diseases of the bone. Um, and here, this case is focusing on diagnosis and treatment, but also on the relation between organs and the muscular skeletal system. Prosthesis or prostheses are artificial substitutes. So if you have an artificial leg or an eye or an artificial hip, those are all prostheses. And lastly, we have rheumatologist and rheumatology. So rheumatol or rheumatic has to deal with diseases of connective tissue and or specifically joints. So um, the rheumatologist studies rheumatic diseases, focusing in on um, the connective tissue and the joints and the, the other inflammation issues. Rounding out the chapter, we have our list of abbreviations. Um, throughout the chapter PowerPoint, you've noticed all the abbreviations in parentheses. Now we're just going to put them together in a nice list for you. Oh. Now that you've made it through the whole chapter, once you start feeling comfortable with all these terms and worked on the exercises throughout the chapter, try exercise 43 uh, through 45 to get a better idea of what you might see when all the words in the chapter are mixed together. Uh, and the next two slides give you an example of exercise 45 where you read aloud and see those medical terms in use.